my mind's eye as I was studying this, I became very engulfed in the scenario and I recognized right away that for me, as I was seeing this, the Lord was speaking to me, not just academically, but spiritually in the inner man, talking to me about his love for me. And as I was reading the passage where Jesus was carrying his own cross to Calvary and fell underneath the weight of the cross, I immediately had a kind of a visual of the scenario where Christ fell down into this dirty, sweaty, bloody soil, caved in under the weight of the cross, and in my mind I saw the Lord turn and look at me and say, Paul, I'm doing this because I love you. And it changed everything. And as I begin to hear him speaking from the cross, these words, behold your son, and the various words that he spoke during that six hours on the cross, there was one thing that happened to me again in the scenario that brought such reality to me, and that was when Jesus said, I thirst. And it dawned on me that of all the suffering that he was going through, all the physical suffering, the spiritual suffering, he was not exempt from the realities of even thirst. He experienced every bit of the cross and the weightiness of it and the shame of sin that was laid upon him. And I remember vividly saying, Lord, with my life, I want to give you a drink. And every day of my life, I'm motivated by the cross. Every day that I study the word and study prophecy and study the various things that we all love and to understand and love to communicate, I'm always reminded that it was in God's great plan from before the foundations of the world that Christ would enter this world to suffer and die in my place for my sin. It motivates me in every part of my life. And I want to share that motivation with you. I want to share the greatness of the cross. Paul the Apostle said in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 18, For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us, or to we who are being saved, it is the power of God. And we understand that as believers. We understand the power of the cross. We understand the power of his sacrifice. But to those that don't know the Lord, that don't love the Lord, don't have a real relationship with the Lord, it seems so silly and so foolish that somebody 2,000 years ago could suffer such a horrifying death on our behalf and that it would have any salvific value for you and for me. To us, it is the power of God. And therefore, we glory only in the cross. Paul said this in chapter 6, verse 14 of Galatians, For God forbid that I should boast, except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. We become otherworldly. We become heavenly minded. There is a call today to become so earthly minded, and some would even suggest that there are Christians that become so heavenly minded that they're no earthly good. I strongly disagree. The more heavenly minded we become, the more good we are for this world, for those around us, those that we're called to serve, those that we're called to teach, to share with the love of God, the gospel of our salvation. I was stunned this past week as I was preparing notes for today in the Christianity Today article that just came out in the edition previous to this month where they talked about the blood of Jesus and they talked about the very traditions of the church and they talked about how we've moved away from talking about things that are gory. They talked about the blood of Christ and how there's such a removal. In fact, some churches today won't allow you to talk about the blood they won't allow you to talk about the cross and crucifixion because people find it grotesque. I want to tell you that the blood of Jesus is beautiful. God is the one that is designed from before the foundations of the world that the most valuable resource this world would ever know is the blood of Jesus. 
They tell us in this article that only eight of the top 100 Christian songs used in today's church even mention the blood of Jesus. And none really focus on it. Now, we do know that there are some changes taking place there. In fact, just a few moments ago, without you noticing, probably, uh, there was a song played called Love Ran Red. It's a new song that just came out, and it's beautiful and talks about the blood of Jesus. And so I'm thankful to see that there is a desire to revisit this and to remove these obstacles that men in their humanness have tried to remove from others as a stumbling block, thinking that they're going to help God with his work by not saying something that's offensive Well, the cross is an offense to many people, but to us, as we mentioned, it is the power of God. And we need to revisit the power of the gospel through the sacrifice of Jesus and through his shed blood and the work that God has done for us. And that's what I want to do today. I want to tell you a little bit as we go through this devotional about some of the former hymns that have been sung in the church for so many years and how important those hymns are. And so with each piece of this uh, devotional, as we build on it, I'm going to also cite for you the lyrics of some of the great hymns. And I have a desire to see these revived. Uh, Thankfully, here at Candlelight, we sing hymns and choruses. And we want to see more and more of that because we believe that there is such good content and it's such a reminder of the things that God has done for us. Things like power in the blood and redeemed, how I love to proclaim it, redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Oh, the blood of Jesus. These songs are familiar to you. There is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins. Are you washed in the blood? My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus blood and righteousness amazing these things that uh, we could let go by and we don't want to let those things go by and can it be that i should gain an interest in my savior's blood uh, and his love for us and what he has done for us and when i survey the wondrous cross on which the prince of glory died this one we don't sing as often And we need to be reminded of these wonderful things. And so today, as we go through this, I'm going to build for you uh, six points, seven points, I believe, that will help illustrate with the scripture and also uh, with these hymns in a devotional setting today. Number one, the cross is a divine worldwide judgment. Number two, the cross demonstrates God's great wrath against sin. Number three, The cross demonstrates the greatness of sin. Number four, the cross, without limitation, reaches the vilest sinner. Number five, the cross demonstrates the inability of the law or any religious system to uh, to make man righteous. Number six, the cross, thank you, Lord, makes the sinner clean. And number seven, finally, the cross shatters the power of sin. And so beginning today here with these things, the cross is a divine worldwide judgment. The cross is a central theme of everything in the Bible. Uh, Those of you that are familiar with this dispensational model, it's a little unique to candlelight and to my thinking, but it places the cross as the central thing. It is right in the middle of all things. And it is from before the foundations of the world, everything that God intended to have manifest for us so that we might know the greatness and the divine worldwide judgment uh, that God had planned on our behalf. The cross was not a plan B. And when we see people today arguing about uh, this crucifixion of Christ and whose fault was it? Did the Romans kill him? Did the Jews kill him? Uh, Did you and I kill him? Uh, This debate and this conversation that continues, I want to point out to you that it was a divine worldwide judgment. It was God that put the sins of the world upon Christ. We see that it was divine in Isaiah chapter 53 verse 10. It pleased the Lord to bruise him. He has put him to grief when you make his soul an offering for sin. It was worldwide in the sense that it covered the sins of the entire world. He himself is the propitiation, the one who died in our place for our sins. 
and not for ours only, but also for the whole world. So therefore worldwide, and it was a judgment. Isaiah chapter 53, verses 4 and 5 tell us, Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted, and he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. And so God in his great wrath, poured out his wrath upon Jesus for us in this divine worldwide judgment. In this hymn, Christ Alone, we read about that. In Christ alone, who took on flesh, fullness of God in helpless babe, this gift of love and righteousness, scorned by the ones he came to save. Till on that cross as Jesus died, the wrath of God was satisfied. For every sin on him was laid. Here in the death of Christ, I live. Secondly, I want to look at the cross as a demonstration of God's great wrath against sin. These graphics you've seen in the movie, The Passion of the Christ. I remember seeing this and also seeing some of the footage from the recent movie that has come out, A.D. Some of you have been watching. And you see some of the sacrifice and the sufferings of Christ. And I remember watching some of these scenes and saying, I can't hardly look at this. I don't ever want to see this again. And we have to recognize that all the things that we think we know about the sufferings of Christ are pale in comparison to the realities of what happened. The physical sufferings of Christ that we see as so difficult and so painful, that those things are only a very small part of the greater suffering and the wrath of God that was poured out on Christ. All the sacrificial system of the old covenant dispensation, everything that we saw all the blood that was shed was a demonstration in type of the sacrifice that took place at Calvary. And it was on Christ himself, the one who could take away the sins of the whole world, not just cover sin as the old covenant dispensational uh, sacrifices would do, but rather take away sin. And John the Baptist introducing Jesus said, behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. This was uncommon to the Jewish mind. They didn't understand that phrase because this sacrifice that they would be accustomed to, all of the sacrifices of the old covenant law, they were only there to cover sin, but they could never take away sin. And there was a constant reminder. And it was a constant reminder until Christ would come and he would bear the wrath of God. And I at the risk of offending some of you today, want to talk a little bit about the wrath of God and the holy hatred of God, his divine displeasure that was poured out on Christ. This wrath was the vengeance that he talks about. A vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. You know that. Give place unto wrath. Jesus suffered the wrath of God on behalf of all men for your sins and for mine. And God was angry with sin. He is angry with the wicked every day, the Bible tells us. We don't like to talk about that. We, we don't want to think about God having holy hatred. And yet, God in his great love also hates sin. And what sin has done and the greatness of sin is very uh, needed today to understand the consequences and the greatness of sin, not only on Christ, but now on a rejecting population and those that willfully reject obedience to God and the consequences, the byproducts of sin. It is a great, great displeasure to God. And this wrath, this holy anger was poured out on Christ for us. God, the Bible tells us, is angry with the wicked every day. This is a tragedy that we should not understand this. We need to know that God has a holiness and his justice being served on Christ uh, on our behalf to satisfy that wrath. 
It's interesting when we read in the Bible some verses that are obscure to us. In Psalm chapter 5 and verse 5, we read, The boastful shall not stand in your sight. You hate all workers of iniquity. That's troubling for us to hear. We want to talk about the love of God, and we do. And it was the love of God manifested in Christ where Christ took that holy hatred upon himself, where he suffered the wrath of God, the anger of God. Psalm 11, verse 5 says, The Lord tests the righteous, but the wicked and the one who loves violence, his soul hates. Proverbs chapter 6, verse 16 through 19 tell us, These six things the Lord hates. Yes, seven are an abomination to him. A proud look, a lying tongue, Hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devises wicked plans, feet that are swift in running to evil, a false witness who speaks lies, and one who sows discord among the brethren. In Isaiah chapter 52, verse 14, we read, Just as many were astonished at you, in prophetic language talking about the sufferings of Christ, so his visage, his body, was marred more than any man. And interestingly, the word marred there in the Hebrew carries with it a connotation of a ceremonial marring. Jesus was the one who fulfilled all the typology of the Old Testament and suffered the wrath of God and the holy hatred of God. I'm reminded of Elijah on Mount Carmel when he prayed and asked the Lord to send fire in the contest between uh, the prophets of Baal and Elijah on behalf of Israel. And when he prayed and the fire of God came down from heaven and struck the sacrifice and the wood and the, the altar itself and the water that had been poured out on it, that fire was a demonstration of the holy hatred, the holy wrath of God that was poured out upon the sacrifice. And that holy hatred was poured out on Christ on our behalf that we might experience the love of God. Our difficulty with this is that when we think of hate, we think of it in a selfish context because we are offended and so therefore we hate. God is offended by sin, but it is his great love that motivates his hatred for sin. And it is his great love that has allowed him by his grace from before the foundations of the world to willingly lay down his life and take that holy hatred upon himself, all the sin of man laid upon Christ on our behalf. And therefore, in Christ, the love of God is manifested and the salvation that is offered to those who believe, given, and the wrath of God satisfied. This brings great peace and great joy to those who understand this, the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. This hymn, When I Survey the Wondrous Cross, says so beautifully, When I survey the wondrous cross on which the Prince of Glory died, my richest gain I count but loss and pour contempt on all my pride. Forbid it, Lord, that I should boast save in the death of Christ my God. All the vain things that charm me most, I sacrifice them to his blood. See from his head, his hands, his feet, sorrow and love flow mingled down. Did e'er such love and sorrow meet, or thorns compose so rich a crown? Were the whole realm of nature mine that were a present far too small love so amazing so divine demands my soul my life my all number three the cross demonstrates the greatness of sin Every time I think about something that I'm going to share with you in a moment that will be very unsettling, I realize that there's something about the cross that we just don't understand. There's so much more than we will understand this side of eternity. 
the sufferings that I mentioned already in his physical marring, in his scourging, in the crown of thorns that was placed upon his head, and the nail driven through his hand, and the spike or nail through his feet, and the public humiliation, all of the exhaustion on the cross, and the thirst that he suffered is nothing in comparison to what really was taking place there in the inner person, in Christ's inner sufferings. When he cried out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from hearing me? When we read in Psalm 22 about all those that gathered around him and they divide, they divide my garments and, and cast lots for my garment and so forth. All the stuff uh, that we see taking place there, we have really such a small glimpse of the things that were taking place there and the greatness of that sacrifice illustrated by some of the most horrible things this world could ever know and the great love that God has that supersedes the holy hatred that is justly deserved upon men that in the great rebellion against God have sinned. The Bible tells us that honest weights and scales are the Lord's. All the weights in the bag are his work. Now this needs some illustration and I need you to understand that Christ suffered and died in our place at Calvary in a period of just hours. All the sins of the whole world that would ever be committed from the time of Adam and Eve in the garden until the end, when, after the great white throne judgment when there is no more sin and no more uh, uncleanness and only righteousness prevails in Christ placed upon him. And if that were even, let's say, uh, a total of six or 7,000 years, uh, then all of those sins being placed upon the Lord, something about that suffering needs to be understood in the context of eternity. See, the sin that men commit without understanding, knowing, and trusting Christ for salvation will cost them an eternity in hell, not six or 7,000 years in hell, or not the equated, if you will, several hours, even if we were to give it the entirety of Christ's life, 33 years on the earth, where he suffered in the human form uh, as a man among us, humbling himself and becoming obedient unto death, even the death of the cross, you would suggest maybe that, well, then the greater sin here is that, in my case, if I sinned for 80 years or 90 years or 100 years, or even if I was the longest living man, 969 years old, and I sinned the entire time, that if the just weight would be that I would suffer in hell for the same number of years, then a 1,000 years and it would be over, but no. Because, see, we will note in the scripture that those who reject the gospel will suffer in an endless hell where the smoke of their torment ascends forever and forever. And so there's something about the cross we don't understand. There's something about the greatness and the magnitude of the sufferings of Christ that we just have scratched the surface on. That if the just weight, the honest weights are the Lord's, that the, he knows that that great suffering that Christ suffered on our behalf is equivalent to the eternal damnation of those who reject him. Amazing to me. How do we understand that? How do we talk about that? Matthew chapter 25, verses 41 through 46 tell us in this parable of the sheep and goats, uh, Jesus speaking, he says, depart from me, you cursed, into the everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. And these will go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. There's something about the cross we just don't understand. There's something about the greatness of sin that we don't understand. There's something about the wrath of God that was poured out on our behalf that we just don't understand. The cross, without limitation, reaches the vilest sinner. I'm glad because the endless eternity has been remedied in Christ. The endless eternity away from him can be satisfactorily handled 
in the gospel and that a believer can be promised everlasting life, the vilest of sinner, the wickedness of man satisfied in the wrath of God on Christ himself. This is one of the most troubling stories I'll tell you today. What you're looking at here is just an illustration. It's, in this case, five businessmen, and the story goes like this. I was in a little church in California that I pastored many, many years ago. And as many of you might know, that the pastoral ministry carries with it many different hats. And in these days, as I was planting that church, I was in the building, cleaning the building uh, in the afternoon. It was a small church and it was just starting and I was listening to the radio and I was listening to a story on Focus on the Family with Dr. James Dobson where he was talking about these businessmen that had abducted a little girl. And they abducted her at the age of six and they had kept her in a closet for six years as a sex toy. And I was so angry. I was so irate as I listened to this story and I became so upset. And as I was all alone in the building, I was crying out to God verbally, out loud. And I said, God, how could you let that happen? And the tragedy of it, the, the horribleness of it, the greatness of sin. And, and I, I made me understand just a little bit of the wrath of God and the holy hatred of God. You understand it. You are upset by this. You don't even want to hear this today. And yet this is a true story. And it was a story about these six men that came to faith in Christ. And as I was listening to the story, I said, God, how can you forgive them? And he spoke one word to me. That one word spoke volumes. Jesus. For the wrath of God, the holy hatred of God, the divine displeasure of God, the greatness of sin, the magnitude of sin, all of man's sin placed on Christ at Calvary for those men, the vilest of sinners. You know the story of Jeffrey Dahmer, a serial killer, a pedophile, and a cannibal. It's horrible. We can tell story after story like this today. We don't need to, but do you know that Jeffrey Dahmer became a believer before his death? He was led to Christ in his prison cell and then served the Lord in the latter days prior to his execution. Jesus suffered the wrath of God that Jeffrey Dahmer deserved. Guys, Jesus suffered the wrath of God that I deserved, the wrath of God that you deserve. He suffered in our place, on our behalf, and I'm so glad he did. John chapter 1, verse 29 says, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Doesn't just cover it, he takes it away. The wrath of God satisfied at the cross. The greatness of the cross. Something about the cross we just don't understand. 1 John chapter 2, verse 2 and he himself is the propitiation for our sins. We read this once already. Not for ours only, but also for the whole world. Jesus suffered in our place to give us life. Suffered the wrath of God that we deserve to give us life. And that life more abundantly. This hymn says, yes I know. Come ye sinners lost and hopeless. Jesus' blood can make you free. For he saved the worst among you when he saved a wretch like me. And I know, yes, I know, Jesus' blood can make the vilest sinner clean. Do you believe that? That Jesus' blood can make the vilest sinner clean? There's people I know that you've been hurt by I know that you've seen tragedies in life and you think they deserve to go to hell. And we carry a holy anger. And you're right, they do deserve to go to hell. And so do we. And God's divine displeasure, his great wrath was poured out on Christ so that the vilest sinner could be made clean. Yes, I know, I know. 
Jesus' blood can make the vilest sinner clean. Number five, the cross demonstrates the inability of the law or any other religious system to make man righteous. This is just a compilation graphic that I put together showing you uh, Roman Catholicism, Hinduism and Buddhism, Mormonism, Jehovah's Witness, Islam, Judaism, even under the law. All the righteous deeds of the law could not make man righteous. There is no man-made system that can make people righteous. It is only in Christ. By grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, we have hope. It is the gospel that we preach. That it is not of man, it is of God. And that it is God's work that from before the foundations of the world, he planned for our redemption in Christ. The vilest of sinners, all of us, that we might have the righteousness of God imputed to us. Romans chapter 4, verses 4 through 8 tell us, To him who works, the wages are not counted as grace, but as debt. If we think that in our own behavior, if we think that by our own good deeds, in our own efforts, that we will merit the favor of God, we're wrong. It just distracts from the greatness of the cross. The work that Christ did on our behalf, his great suffering to redeem us unto himself. To him who works, the wages are not counted as grace, but as debt. But to him who does not work, but believes on him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is accounted for righteousness. Just as David also describes the blessedness of the man to whom God imputes righteousness apart from works. Blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord shall not impute sin. See, blessed are you because God has not just covered your sins, but remove them forever. All of our righteousness was as filthy rags, but he has redeemed us. All of our human works, filthy rags, and he has washed us. Hebrews chapter seven, verses 18 and 19. There is an annulling of the law because of its weakness and its unprofitableness. For the law made nothing perfect. It only pointed out our sinfulness. It pointed out our depravity. But he washed us white as snow. Romans chapter 3, verse 20. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, any law, any man-made system, but in this case, the old covenant law that was given to the Jews to point them to Christ, to point them to the sufferings of Christ, by that deeds of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. And therefore, Paul tells us in Galatians chapter 2, verse 21, I do not set aside the grace of God, for if righteousness comes through the law, then Christ died in vain. The greatness of the cross. The song Rock of Ages highlights some of this. Rock of Ages, cleft for me, let me hide myself in thee. Let the water and the blood from thy wounded side which flowed Be of sin the double cure. Save from wrath and make me pure. Not the labor of my hands can fulfill thy law's demands. Could my zeal no respite know? Could my tears forever flow? All for sin could not atone. Thou must save and thou alone. Nothing in my hand I bring. Simply to thy cross I cling. Naked come to thee for dress. Helpless look to thee for grace. Foul I to the fountain fly. Wash me, Savior, or I die. We can't even sing those words until we understand the greatness of sin. We can't understand the greatness of his sacrifice until we understand the greatness of sin. We can't understand the sacrifice until we understand God's holy hatred for sin and how that he poured out his divine wrath on Christ and that we can come with nothing of our own in exchange for our lives. It is all of Christ. Nothing in my hand I bring. Simply to thy cross I cling. 
Naked come to thee for dress. Helpless look to thee for grace. Foul I to the fountain fly. Wash me, Savior, or I die. Number six, the good news. The cross makes the sinner clean. There is therefore now no condemnation to those that are in Christ Jesus. Aren't you glad? Paul tells us about this in the scripture. Jesus, verse, uh, well, Hebrews, we don't know who wrote. And we'll argue that. We'll get to Paul's uh, passage here in Romans in a moment. Jesus, who being the brightness of his glory, of his, that is God's glory, and the express image of his person, and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins. He had by himself purged our sins, not with our help. He did it by himself. And he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. Now you've heard me, some of you have heard me tell this truth many times. But one of the things that startles me when I see this is that before I was ever born, Christ did this. Before I ever sinned, Christ did this. He knew from before the foundations of the world every sin I would ever commit and took upon himself all the sin that I would commit before I was ever born and finished the sacrificial work and then sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high before I was even born. He provided a cure. Now, why is that important? Because some people will suggest that their sin is too great. If you only knew what I have done, if you only knew the greatness of my sin, if you only knew the blasphemies of my heart, before you were ever born and capable of sinning, Christ already knew. And he paid the price for you. No sin too great. His blood can make the vilest sinner clean. Yes, I know. Yes, I know. Amen. Second Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. The vilest sinner becomes the righteousness of God in Christ, not by works of righteousness which you have done, but according to his mercy. You see, God is righteous. God is holy. And we ask the question, how righteous is God? And when we answer, completely righteous, totally righteous, we know then that he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we, you and me, might become the righteousness of God in him. That's hope. That's life. That's peace. That's good news. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 16 through 19. And this is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their hearts and in their minds, and I will write them. And then he adds, their sins and their lawless deeds I will remember no more. Now, we know that ultimately this will be fulfilled with the Jews at the time of the second coming and beyond into the millennial reign. But for you and I as recipients, by God's grace, of this covenant. It applies to you now. It applies to you this very moment. Your sins and your lawless deeds. He remembers no more. You have been made the righteousness of God. In Christ. That is reason to celebrate. This hymn. Illustrates so well. And you know the story behind it. But the doctrinal perspective here. That I want to bring out. These two verses I highlight for you. Though Satan should buffet, though trials should come, let this blessed assurance control that Christ hath regarded my helpless estate and has shed his own blood for my soul and my sin. And I wish I hadn't been sick all week because I'd sing. Oh, the bliss of this glorious thought. My sin, not in part, but the whole, 
is nailed to the cross and I bear it no more. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Oh, my soul. When Jesus was crucified, he had a thief on the left and a thief on the right. Just briefly, let me bring this to a close by suggesting a couple of things to you. You are one or the other. See, early on in the crucifixion scene, both the thieves were railing on Jesus. But later, remember, one had a change of mind. And he said, remember me. Now, most of you here are believers, and I understand that. But we have people watching online today. We have people that will watch this later. And so maybe as you're watching now, some of you that will be watching this later, you need to be hearing this. Which thief are you? Are you the thief that continued railing against the Lord? Are you the thief that said, remember me and trust Christ for salvation? Jesus told that thief, today you will be with me in paradise. You and I have hope, you guys. The vilest of us, the worst of us, the hideous nature of sin and the, the byproduct of sin, all remedied in Christ by grace alone through faith alone in Christ alone and not of yourselves lest anyone should boast all him all to Jesus then surrender all to him freely give love and trust him and in his presence you will daily live the cross shatters the power of sin there's the verse I was looking for when I mentioned Paul. Romans chapter 8, verses 1 through 4. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. And I recognize that many fail to fully understand the impact of this verse. They think, well, if I'm walking in the flesh, then I'm not saved. If I'm walking in the flesh, then I haven't been cleansed or I've lost my cleansing. No, no, not at all. I'm not suggesting, and I think you would understand the greatness of sin, the horrible nature of sin, and the great uh, sacrifice that Christ made for us, that you yourself would be motivated to live righteously in these last days, these end times. These days in which we look around and we see the hideousness of sin of all the times in the world. Now is our opportunity to be living as we should before the Lord, before men. Our testimony matters. But then again, in misunderstanding the verse, some would suggest that they've lost their salvation because they're sinning or that there is no righteousness imputed to them because of their fleshliness. But if you read the entirety of Romans chapter eight, you'll see that those that are born again are in the spirit, period, end of subject. That doesn't mean that you can't misbehave after the flesh or that you can do things that you wouldn't desire to do as Paul illustrates in uh, chapter seven of Romans, but that you are in Christ and you have been sealed with the Holy Spirit, and you are in the Spirit, and therefore there is no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit, by faith in Christ. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ has made me free from the law of sin and death. We're free from sin. We're free from the consequences of sin and the penalties of sin because Christ took them upon himself. In the eternal con context, there is no future condemnatory judgment for the believer. It is all done in Christ. There are temporal consequences for sin and thus we live righteously. But we need to know that we have been made free from the law that condemns. The law of sin and death. And for what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, God did by sending his own son into the, in the likeness of sinful flesh on account of sin. He condemned sin in the flesh that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh 
but according to the Spirit. And as believers, you do walk according to the Spirit by faith in Christ and in Christ alone. Therefore, let us agree with Paul when he said, God forbid that I should boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. This hymn also so beautifully illustrates in Christ alone who took on flesh fullness of God in helpless babe this gift of love and righteousness scorned by the ones he came to save till on that cross as Jesus died the wrath of God was satisfied for every sin on him was laid here in the death of Christ I live. And as he stands in victory, sin's curse has lost its grip on me. For I am his and he is mine, bought with the precious blood of Christ. No guilt in life, no fear in death. This is the power of Christ in me. From life's first cry to final breath, Jesus commands my destiny. No power of hell, no scheme of man could ever pluck me from his hand till he returns or calls me home. Here in the power of Christ I stand. And finally, a song that has meant more to me over the years and probably so many others. Andre Crouch wrote this during my lifetime. <laughs> and so it's a contemporary hymn, but with its great meaning and its great message. The blood that Jesus shed for me way back on Calvary. The blood that gives me strength from day to day will never lose its power. It reaches to the highest mountain where people are lofty, where people are accomplished. And it flows to the lowest valley where the vilest of sinner might live. The blood that gives me strength from day to day will never lose its power. I'm glad. For the holy hatred for sin was manifested in the holy wrath of God on his only begotten son on our behalf that we might be made the righteousness of God in him from he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God in him by faith alone through the grace of God in Christ alone. Shall we pray? Lord, thank you for the privilege and blessing to understand and know this much. We know that there's something about the cross we don't understand. There's so much about the cross we don't understand, but one thing we do know, that the wrath of God was satisfied at Calvary on our behalf. And Lord, we thank you for saving us and calling us and equipping us to share this good news with others. Lord, may we never shrink back to call sin, sin. May we never shrink back in recognizing that there is a holy hatred for that which harms people. Lord, you love your creation and you love people so much that you do hate what harms. But you've also remedied that problem in Christ by making your wrath to be manifest in him that you may demonstrate your love for us. And that love was manifest while we were still sinners and when Christ died for us. And for all of us that are here today before we were ever born, you died for our sin. Every sin that we would ever commit, even the sins that we will still commit 
you already paid for. And we thank you. And Lord, that motivates us to recognize your great suffering, the greatness of the agony, and that we are motivated knowing that our sin added to your suffering. And therefore, we choose to live righteously in the present age. And Lord, we've been set free from the power of sin, and therefore we ask, empower us to walk in such a way that we give glory and honor to you. Let us love one another. Let us love those around us. But first and foremost, Lord, let us love you. And we do. And we thank you. Thank you for letting us see you and know you so that we can say, yes, I love the Lord. Because we know you. And we do love you. Thank you, Lord, for your great sacrifice on our behalf. We give you praise today in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord.